Before we get into the thick of things here in episode four, I want to say thank you to everyone who listened to the first three episodes of Art Wonderful last week and made the launch of this podcast so amazing. I couldn't have asked for a better response, and your feedback has truly been incredible. I had the pleasure of hearing from some of you in person this past weekend at the opening of Unloved Creatures, and it really was a boost to get your support and hear what you thought of the first three episodes. It also helped to hear that you're looking forward to more episodes in the future. It only makes me want to dig my heels in deeper and give it my all in providing valuable content for you, and to do so at the very best of my ability. So thank you all once again, and without further ado, let's jump into things in 4, 3, 2. Hello art enthusiasts and art lovers, welcome to episode 4 of Art Wonderful. The art podcast where art is a religion. I'm your host, Nicholas Harper. I'm broadcasting from my art studio deep within the Rogue Buddha Gallery. That's in the heart of the Northeast Arts District in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to thank you for joining me as we explore everything the arts have to offer. It's the mission of this podcast to spread the gospel of the arts, their essential value to our everyday lives, and to offer a deep dive exploration into this, a most mysterious subject. You can learn more about myself, the Rogue Buddha Gallery, this podcast, and those we have on the show by visiting us online at roguebuddha.com. Click podcast from the menu. And be sure to listen to the end of this and every episode, as I'll be sharing my pick of what art event you simply can't miss this weekend should you find yourself in our neck of the woods, here in the lovely Twin Cities. This is brought to you by our amazing partner, we art enthusiasts simply can't live without, mplsart.com. As we're still getting to know each other on this fancy new podcast, I thought it appropriate to share a bit more about my approach to the arts, but this time as a curator. In the first episode, I laid out a bit of my art paradigm in terms of a general approach to the arts, painting, if you will, with a wide brush. See what I did there? As a brief recap, I basically approached the arts as a tool or vehicle for learning more about ourselves, believing that art is a window to our soul, and that every new painting that we find to resonate with us does so because it connects us to ourself. That spark of electricity we get when falling in love with a painting, for instance, well, that happens because essentially we've found a soulmate. We've found another piece of the puzzle that, while it may never be a completed picture, it is fuller and indeed brought more into focus. As a curator, it's important to me to exhibit work that first and foremost resonates with me and my artistic sensibilities. Perhaps my approach to curating is a bit more personal than most galleries because I'm an artist myself, and much of what I exhibit is based on my personal artistic curiosities, likes, and inspirations. It's rare that I would exhibit artwork that didn't touch my soul and in some way influence and inspire my own artwork. Another key element fundamental to my curatorial approach and again, one that perhaps distinguishes the Rogue Buddha from other galleries that aren't operated by a working artist, is in how I approach the gallery itself, and see it as more than just an art gallery. What I mean by this is that I see the gallery really as an extension of my creative process, and as such, I see it as a sort of work of art in and of itself. Again, this is because of the intimate relationship I have with the work on exhibit, and having the ability to curate work I love by artists I admire affords me an opportunity to present a vision that is in many ways representative of my own soul. This closely parallels the process of making an original work of art, in that it's an unfurling of my soul's identity and represents how I see the world, or how I wish to portray it via what I put into it. The big difference lies in the fact that this work of art, the gallery, is a living, breathing, 
always growing and morphing live sculpture. One that I believe embraces the totality of the past 20 years of its existence and has been manifesting through countless exhibits, musical performances, theatrical shows, literary events, not to mention weddings, receptions, birthday parties, and pretty much any event you can wrap your head around. In my mind, the rogue Buddha is a living sculpture that testifies to the soul experiencing itself through every form of human expression. And it does so through its most important and valuable asset, the people. Part of what I'm going to say next springs from my ideas on what it means to exhibit artwork and make work available to the public as an artist. That's really a topic for another episode, so I won't delve into it too deeply here. What I will say is that I view the artists who exhibit here as being collaborators in this larger living sculpture as much as they are exhibiting their individual works of art. Once an artist makes their work available to the public, it enters a different realm than where it was when being made or sitting in a studio. That work has now joined a larger community and as such occupies, in my opinion, a different philosophical space, if you will. The final component to this living sculpture comes by way of the guests and patrons who I also view as collaborators, as they're just as necessary to the manifestation of this larger work of art. I can't help but think of the countless people who have in some way shared the most intimate parts of their life, the most defining moments in their life, and those moments that will forever be held as special within the four walls of this gallery, whether that be in the form of a wedding or a wedding reception, even marriage proposals, to birthday parties, reunions, memorial events for loved ones that have passed, and even send-offs for those soon to pass. Some of these moments weren't planned, in fact, some coming by way of two strangers meeting for the first time at a gallery event, only to find out that they were married sometime later. It's these moments that validate my notion that it's the people who supply the richness and vitality of the gallery and breathe life into its four walls. And it's the people, the artists and patrons, volunteers and visitors, who truly make this space a living, breathing work of art. A third key element to my curatorial approach has to do with my personal aesthetic sensibilities and what I find to be beautiful and how I define my role in sharing that beauty with the world. I was once criticized in an online journal in which an article claimed the gallery and artwork exhibited here didn't have a quote-unquote brand. They found this detrimental and as such were disappointed that the rogue Buddha wasn't living up to its potential. I appreciate their concern. Oddly enough, in describing the gallery for its readers, they used a number of descriptors that, as far as I can tell, described a pretty well-defined brand, if I do say so myself. If my memory serves me right, they talked about the gallery having a penchant for the macabre or a dark sensibility, that much of the work was figurative and within the genre of pop surrealism or magical realism. They talked about the dark walls and candles flickering. While they didn't hone it down to one or two words or a simple-to-remember phrase, they were in fact sharing the brand of the gallery. Now, this quote-unquote brand wasn't artificially concocted or one that I even necessarily set out to create. It emerged over time as my curatorial interests evolved, and that evolution was intimately connected to my own artwork and how it evolved. As I became more interested in magical realism and the figure as an artist myself, so too the exhibits began to offer more figuration with a heavy bent towards magical realism and pop surrealism. As my proclivity towards heavy shadows, rich and dark coloring, began to manifest ever more within my own painting, so too the gallery exhibits began to mirror this the artwork gravitating to a dark and moody, perhaps even the macabre or noir sensibility. And as it did so, this work on exhibit began to feed back into my own work, inspiring me and influencing what I was making, 
And thus, a type of dance has emerged in which the gallery and my work are inextricably linked. Also born from this organic evolution has been the many friendships formed with the artists that exhibit at the Rogue Buddha on a regular or somewhat regular basis. It's out of these friendships that I find a constant well of inspiration for both my artwork and for the gallery. And it's these relationships that in many ways has fueled the gallery's existence over the past 20 years. The point here is that over time, I've formulated a certain aesthetic that is near and dear to my heart, one that I wish to share with the world. For lack of better terminology, one could refer to it as beautiful strange. I like this phraseology, beautiful strange, not so much as it refers to a genre of art per se, but in that it encapsulates a mood of the content of what one might expect to see in the gallery, placing emphasis on beauty, as I see it, and on the fact that the content of the work, or the work itself by way of execution, is, for a lack of a better word, strange. In many ways, my personal draw to the quote-unquote strange and to quote-unquote dark beauty began as a child, and is a manifestation of my love of mystery and the unknowable nature of our universe. One of the biggest influences to inform this interest came by way of Catholicism. Perhaps you won't be surprised to learn that I was raised Catholic. But more than that, and more importantly, I was raised by a mother who was a church cantor and choir director. In lieu of daycare, preschool, and babysitters, I spent much of my earliest years in the choir lofts of most of the churches that dot the Northeast Minneapolis landscape, and there's a lot of them. Every weekend, I found myself spying down on the congregation and numerous masses and Saturday afternoon weddings, and during the week, I was privy to funerals that my mother sang for. Other than perhaps a circus or carnival existence, I can't think of a better upbringing to influence what has become my current body of work or the current manifestation of the Rogue Buddha Gallery by way of its decor. And that leads to a final element key to my curatorial approach that I'll touch on today, and that is the setting in which I exhibit the work on hand, one that I believe truly distinguishes the Rogue Buddha, as it is very much informed by my earliest years in various churches and expresses my notion of the power and role art has in our lives and how I see my role as a curator. I should make a quick mention here that when I say something distinguishes my gallery from others, that isn't to say makes it better than others. Ideally, each and every gallery will have its own distinct personality and will reflect the personality of the owner or curator. I use words like distinguish so as to help paint a picture for you, especially those that have never been in the Rogue Buddha Gallery, so as to give you a better idea of what the Rogue Buddha looks like and to better let you know how this gallery fits into the world of the arts and other galleries. So back to the church and how it influenced what you'll see at the RBG. That kind of rhymed, wasn't intentional. Many elements, though common to a church, can be found in the gallery. Dimmed lighting, candles, richly colored walls, stained wood, and incense. Again, this wasn't created overnight and wasn't necessarily purposeful. As I grew into the space and into my art, so too it evolved over time. Again, though, there are no pews or fonts of holy water, so no worries about genuflecting or making the sign of the cross. No Kool-Aid here. But central to the gallery, perhaps more subconsciously at first, and now quite obvious to me, is the idea that I want to create a space that is sacred, that holds the artwork on exhibit and what it stands for as something truly special. And just as churches and cathedrals are designed in such a way as to be a relief from the outside world and its quote-unquote realities, and to uplift the spirit, so too I want the Rogue Buddha Gallery to be a space separate from the outside world. I want it to be an intimate place that offers the viewer somewhere to connect with the art and ultimately with themselves, free of distraction and the noise of the quote-unquote out there. While I use the gallery to continually renew my fondness for the mysterious and the unknowable, so too I want to inspire in others that same sense of wonder and magic and awe, and to do so with a reverence conducive to a sacred space. After all, most artists, they bare their soul in making their art. 
The least I can do in sharing it with the public is to present it in a manner that treats it with the reverence it deserves. While each exhibit at the Rogue Buddha is unique unto itself, most tend to adhere to my personal sense of aesthetic beauty and craftsmanship, have an air of that strangeness I was talking about, and also do so while having the potential for storytelling and allegory, or myth-making. This is why I'm so drawn to magical realism as an artistic genre. Again, I'll talk more about that in a future episode. But the current exhibit, which just opened on Friday the 14th, Valentine's Day, is a perfect demonstration of where my curatorial passions lie. The Unloved Creatures exhibit is one near and dear to my heart as it encapsulates much of what the Rogue Buddha Gallery paradigm is all about. That is, from a curatorial or exhibition programming standpoint. This exhibit has a little bit of everything I love, from fantasy to magical realism to monsters to ephemera. It's light and dark at the same time, while opening a world of mystical enchantment. The work on exhibit affords the opportunity to tell stories and encapsulate myth and allegory. From Alex Kuno's pieces, which are storytelling and fairy tale incarnate, to Heather Renault's vignettes of wondrous circus worlds, to Eli Lipson's dreamscapes populated with mythic creatures. Kao Li presents us with mesmerizing images that seemingly drip off the canvas. Jesse McNally brings a tattooing and iconic sensibility to her vibrant and robust paintings. Angel Hawari and DC Ice add whimsy through their twisted and fanciful works. And rounding out the exhibit is John Sauer, whose melancholic robots and fictional creatures open our hearts to wonder and ennui simultaneously. As the title of this exhibit suggests, this is a very un-Valentine's exhibit populated by creatures so unlovable you can't help but love them completely. And really, that part about being unlovable, well, that's not exactly true, as so many of these works embody a beauty and a quality of craftsmanship that I can't help but be impressed by, and I'm honored to have adorning the walls of the rogue Buddha. If you find yourself in our neck of the woods, between now and March 14th, I would highly encourage you to come by during regular gallery hours and take in the worlds and universes these eight amazing artists of Unloved Creatures have presented for us. Perhaps they will allow you a path to open up new worlds and universes within yourself. Now, I need to make a note here and give a special shout out as the Unloved Creatures exhibit didn't originate with me. In fact, it was the brainchild of one of the participating artists, Eli Lipson. Back in 2018, Eli attended an art opening I had at Gallery 360 in South Minneapolis. It was there that he introduced himself and pitched the idea of this show, which at that time wasn't yet named. He listed three artists that he wanted to exhibit with and thought the Rogue Buddha was the perfect fit. One of the artist's names, Alex Kuno, was very familiar to me as he had exhibited in the gallery before. John Sauer, as it turns out, was someone I had been watching for a few years at the coffee shop Northeast, a cafe in Northeast I frequent. The last artist, Heather Renault, I was unfamiliar with, but when I saw the work she made, was an instant fan. A year later, Unloved Creatures debuted as the gallery's feature Valentine's exhibit. Because of its popularity and its ideal fit for the gallery and for the season, we decided to present the exhibit again, now in 2020, but with a twist. Each of the core four artists picked another artist to join in the fun, thus making it an eight-person exhibit. I was familiar with and a fan of each of the new additions, and thus, Unloved Creatures 2020 was again scheduled as our feature Valentine's exhibit. Based on the continued success of this show, I am more than willing to bet we will see a new iteration of Unloved Creatures 2021 next year. But all this is to say that not all exhibits at the Rogue Buddha originate with me. My role in this exhibit was merely in identifying Eli's pitch as a good fit, and my willingness to take a chance on some new faces and on a group that hadn't shown together before. I couldn't have been happier with the outcome, and so mad props to Eli Lipson for having the vision and the dedication and follow-through to put this exhibit together, not just once, but two years in a row. 
Oh, also, speaking of those sometimes situations where two people meet at the gallery and get married. Well, that just happened to be the case with Eli and his wife, Kim. So congratulations to you both, and I couldn't be happier that you guys met here at the gallery. As a side note, to artists out there looking for a show, I don't encourage the path Eli took in approaching and pitching an exhibit at an art opening. I can't tell you how many times people approach me at the gallery opening night with cell phone in hand and pictures at the ready. An opening night just isn't the right time or place for such a discussion. I'll be talking about ways to approach galleries and what to think about before doing so in another episode. The fact that things worked out the way they did with this exhibit, well, that's just how fate works sometimes. And I'm not going to second guess fate. So speaking of great exhibits, opening in the Twin Cities, Objects in Flux opens Friday, February 21st from 6 until 8 p.m. at the Bloomington Art Center. Wisconsin artists Craig Clifford and Debbie Kopinski both incorporate everyday objects in their ceramic installations to examine and investigate the role such items play in society and pop culture. Clifford utilizes commercial plaster molds to create items such as teacups, serving pieces, and figurines that are layered together to create assemblages, a kind of collage in clay. Likewise, Kopinski recreates common everyday items in clay as a way to explore how objects can be carriers of meaning, memories, and nostalgia in different ways to different people. The works are meant to show themselves in layers of information that is revealed to the viewer over time. You can find out more details about this exhibit, again opening Friday, February 21st at Bloomington Art Center, and all of the wonderful art events taking place this weekend at mplsart.com. That's mplsart.com. They have a passion for sharing the talents of our fair twin cities like none other, and their directory of galleries and events, it's unsurpassed. So be sure to check out mplsart.com. And that's a wrap for this episode of Art Wonderful, coming to you again from deep inside the Rogue Buddha Gallery. I want to thank you for joining me, and I hope you do so again and often as we release new episodes every Monday night. Until next time, remember, the best life is the creative life, and the best self is the artistic self. Cheers.